pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. Oh, and we thank you for Jesus. Father, you are good. The grace and the mercy that you've extended to us is far beyond what we deserve. Father, as we let your word paint this picture, paint this this portrait, this story of Esther, Father, we need your Holy Spirit to come. We need your Holy Spirit, Father, to minister to our hearts, to direct our path. Father, we, we pray that you would just do something special in our midst today. Father, illuminate your word. Give me the words to say. Help me to not say the things that I shouldn't. Forgive me for where I've failed you, Father, but I pray that your spirit would quicken me in this moment. And through your word, Father, reach your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, before we jump in, if you have your phones, pull it out and let's share the service. I didn't say this earlier. Uh, Let's like and share this post real quick on Facebook. Come on, hurry, hurry, pull your phone out, pull it out, like and share this post. Honestly, I'm, I'm really enjoying the... Uh, thank you for that sermon bumper. That's really good. Uh, I'm, I'm just really enjoying watching our online community grow. And there's going to be more that we're doing to add to that. But if you can, like and share that post on Facebook and uh, inv- invite someone to come to church with us. All of you that are watching that are normal Bethlehem folks, I hear you. I love you. Stay safe. Those that are elderly and immune compromised, um, I'm just I'm thankful that we can be together this way. Um, and, and I pray that the Lord will use this message in, in your heart and in your life today. Honestly, I'm, I'm really pumped about this. There's going to be several moments in this message that just bring so much clarity to the plan of the Lord and to how, how Scripture is weaved in and out. I mean, it's going to bring Exodus into Esther today. Uh, it's going to bring uh, thoughts and moments of clarity from Esther's story to our story And how many believe that the Bible is just one continuous interwoven story of redemption? How many of you believe that? We're going to see that today. I mean, we're going to see it loud and clear. If you think it's just a bunch of broken up stories that really don't coordinate or go together, man, we're going to see the exact opposite today. But before we see that, pause for a moment. Amen. Here we are. We're good. We're ready. We're back. Amen. But this, this is going to really uh, bring some incredible points to view. And so I'm going to kind of walk through it, and we're going to highlight certain scriptures. So just to give you an idea, we've covered chapter 1, chapter 2. If you haven't heard those messages, go back and listen to those messages on our YouTube channel, on our podcast, if you need to just listen to it. Uh, go back and consume that content, because I don't have time Uh, for sake of the content that we have today to review. Um, So we have other characters that have been introduced, Ahasuerus, Vashti, uh, Esther, Mordecai, and today we're going to cover two chapters, chapter 3 and chapter 4. So we have a lot of ground to cover. Uh, But what I'm going to do is we're going to read the scriptures today, and we're going to highlight verses through chapter 3 and and chapter 4 that really set the stage and will kind of reveal to you the storyline and what's happening. And then I'm going to go back and work through that storyline in such a way that I believe will will be very edifying to you. And then we'll make kind of a a big appeal at the end um, as as there's a huge reversal and a narrative shift in the story at the end of chapter 4. So that's the plan. Let's get to it. Uh, Esther chapter 3, verse number 1, if you have your Bibles. If not, it'll be on the screens. Uh, Cody, it's not going to work. The verses are not going to go into the uh, live stream. So if you're, if you're watching online, it's, it's a long story. I'll, I'll explain later. I take full responsibility. Um, but if you're watching online, you will need your Bibles or you can see it maybe on the screen behind me. Um, but we're going to go to Esther chapter 3, verse number 1. Esther chapter 3, verse number 1, and we're going to bounce around a little bit. Let's read here. After all this took place, King Ahasuerus honored Haman, son of Hamedatha the Agagite. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. The Agagite. He promoted him in rank and gave him a higher position than all the other officials. So we have here a new character introduced to our narrative. And I submit to you that the character is the villain. This is the villain. Haman, or Haman as I've called him since I was a kid. Uh, Haman. Haman is introduced. We have a new character on the scene. Go to verse number 8. Verse number 8. Then Haman informed King Ahasuerus, so he's the 
the new second in command. Then Haman informed King Ahasuerus, there is one ethnic group scattered throughout the peoples in every province of your kingdom, keeping themselves separate. Their laws are different from everyone else's and they do not obey the king's laws. It is not in the king's best interest to tolerate them. If the king approves, let an order be drawn up authorizing their destruction. And then he goes even further. And I will pay 375 tons of silver to the officials for deposit in the royal treasury. Verse number 10. The king removed his signet ring from his hand, gave it to Haman, the son of Hamaditha the Agagite. It says it again. The enemy of the Jews. The enemy of the Jews. The story is unfolding. Villain comes on the scene. Villain gets some... Uh, villain gets some power, and said power has gone to villain's head, and the villain is now scheming to kill these people that he doesn't like. Verse number 15. Let's go to verse number 15 of chapter 3. The king and Haman sat down to drink while the city of Susa is in confusion. So we have the new decree that goes out to kill all of the Jews, and Haman is like, shall we have a glass of wine? I mean, this guy, we know that this king, he doesn't need an excuse to have another drink, does he? He's been drinking since the book started. He's, he's still, it took him seven days to get a buzz. This guy's what we define as a functioning alcoholic, right? And so Haman is like, let me get that signet ring, shoot. And he's like, sure, how about another bottle of wine from the cellar? And, and then they, they literally signed the decree that all the Jews are going to be killed. And what does he do? Let's have another glass. They're sitting there toasting to what is happening, the demise of these people. Chapter four, verse number one. Go to chapter four, verse number one. When Mordecai learned all that had occurred, um, one moment. We're having a significant amount of interference up here. When Mordecai learned all that had occurred, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went into the middle of the city and cried loudly, bitterly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read verse two. It's not in there, but... He went only as far as the king's gate, since the law prohibited anyone wearing sackcloth from entering the king's gate. So we see the, the response from Mordecai, right? The decree goes out. The decree is all the Jews are going to be killed. Mordecai puts on sackcloth and ashes, which is a kind of a burlap sack. It's an itchy garment that is not comfortable. It's to show their discomfort and their uh, desire for the Lord to intervene. Go to verse number 13. And then we'll read verse 13 through 17. I mean, this, this passage, all of you should like highlight these verses in your Bible, circle them. They're incredible. They're monumental. They will help you. They've helped me. Just the verses alone, much less what we're going to learn from them. Look at verse number 13. How many believe that the word of God is alive? How many believe it's powerful? Okay, listen to this. Verse 13. Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther. Don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you're in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance, this is incredible, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. Mordecai was a man driven by his theology, not his feelings. We'll save that for another moment. But he says, look, don't think it's going to save you just because you're the queen. If you keep silent, it's going to come from somewhere else. Relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place. But you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come. This is such a famous part. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Whew, that's powerful. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. And here's the, the reversal in chapter 3 and chapter 4. Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go. Assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, uh, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if, uh, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded him. My goodness. So let's, let's double back. Everybody has a kind of a clear view of the story, right? Chapter 3, chapter 4, we have a villain that comes on to the scene. What's the villain's name? Haman or Haman? Let's pick one. Let's say Haman today. 
The villain's name, just to, just to get on Cody's nerves, the, the villain's name is Haman. What's the villain's name? Haman. Haman. Turn to your wife and say, I'm sorry, just, no, never mind. We'll, we'll leave that one out. Lord, help me not to say the things I shouldn't say. We have a villain that has entered the story. His name is Haman. Now, in the pronunciation, which I tend to, to, to wreck and ravish, uh, his name, Haman, is really close to Hamon in, in Hebrew, which literally means confusion. So if this guy, he's second in, in, second in command, riding his chariot through the streets, look, it's confusion running through the streets. Like that's literally what the Jewish people were thinking. So when, when this guy comes on the scene as a, as a leader and someone who is a mover and shaker in the kingdom with a name like confusion, most Jews were probably snickering at the guy's name. They're like, <laughs> you know, and with the deep roots of like the Agagites, basically and this, a descendant from the Amalekites, uh, you know, they've been enemies to the Jews from the get, from the beginning. Um, so no doubt all the little children in the streets were laughing. Ha, 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 there's confusion. He doesn't know what he's doing. Uh, so there's this, like, tension beneath that we English-speaking people don't really get and don't really understand. But these names have a ton of significance. As the story is being uh, told, the villain comes out, and the villain is, is sheer confusion. Um, but the villain is not confused about what his mission is. If there are any of those wireless mics up there that are on besides mine, that will, that will cause what's happening. So just make sure those are off. Um, so anyway, because it's causing me confusion hearing this up, up here for Haman. Uh, but that being said, we find that this villain is introduced on the scene and, and his name is, is Haman. Uh, pulling from the evangelical commentary here, most interpreters through the ages have understood that the text to mean that Haman was a descendant of Agag, king of the Amalekites. And this is where... Uh, the story, it just, it gets so rich when considering these little genealogies that are mentioned where Haman comes from and who his daddy is. Listen to this verse from Exodus chapter 17, verse 16. A war will be for Yahweh with Amalek from generation to generation. So prophesied, and, and this is just one of those tidbits for those that uh, have friends that are atheists or people that don't believe the Bible. Like if you study the Bible, the more you study it, the more in awe you are. The more interwoven, the more uh, it all makes sense, the more it all comes together. I promise you, you, you can never, the, the more time you put in, the better you are and the better you come out of it. The more you dig in, the more it makes sense. And so honestly, like it, it's, it's incredible to see something like this. God chooses a people, Right, And it's the children of Israel. And when considering their story, uh, and we think about the Exodus journey, he, journey, he chooses a people and, and leads them. They have an exodus, an exit from bondage, from oppression. The gospel from the beginning is here to liberate us from slavery. Uh, the fact that we have a culture today in America that is trying to suppress a voice, suppress the churches, suppress the gospel because they think it is anti, they think that it is pro-slavery, they don't know the Bible, they don't know the story of the Bible, they don't understand that it is biblical truth, that it is literally the gospel story that ends slavery, that ends and begins countries and, and whole empires on the trajectory towards freedom, not bondage, right? And so this message is loud and clear coming through the text, but to understand that literally from the beginning, as the Lord is choosing the children of Israel and deploying them as his people that will bring the Messiah. Messiah as a vehicle to the earth, he says, you know what, you're going to be at war with the Amalekites. There is Amalek, uh, a, 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 a force in this world that is opposing, he's an opposing force, opposing Yahweh, the God of Israel. And so this is a conflict this is a conflict that is seen over and over. The, the children of Israel then, once they're freed from bondage, and this is just kind of in a nutshell here, follow with me. Once they're, they, they're established as a nation, we know the, the story, and, and the Lord blesses them, and they begin to grow. They reach a point where they want a king like all the other nations is the phrase that's used in Samuel. Um, and so they move from being this theocracy where God is their leader, where God is their king, to wanting a what? A physical king on earth. And then you have books that, that go through this in scripture about the kings, and they document that. Does anyone know the first king of Israel? Can anybody, this is Bible trivia. 
the first Saul. Saul was the first king. And, and an interesting fact about Saul is that he knew himself that he was, an, he was not supposed to be the king. You see, Jesus was, is the king of kings and lord of lords, and he is described as the lion of the tribe of, anybody know? Judah. So within Israel, there were 12 tribes, 12 sons, uh, and one of those sons, Judah, was the line that the kings were supposed to come through. Um, so David, being of the tribe of Judah, if they would have waited one more generation, I, I wonder if it would have gone better for them. Rather than all of the reversals that they experienced with forcing the narrative, forcing, we want a king like all the other nations. And what did they do? They pick a guy who's head and shoulders, Samuel says, head and shoulders above all the other people and leave it to people to do that. We pick the, the strongest, the shiniest, the, the brightest, the tallest, the smartest. We pick those people to, to be the people that, that, surely God, this is who you want to use. Surely you want the talent. And God says, I don't want any of that. I want to be the one that gets the glory. I am the good one. I am the king. I am the one who's going to triumph over this situation. I don't need man to figure it out. Remember this book. We're getting there. I know I'm going on a long story time to get there, but God is in control of the larger narrative here. So in their narrative of them becoming a nation, really like all the other nations, which led to their captivity, they elected Saul. And Saul says this fun fact. He says, I'm a Benjamite. I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. Just because I'm tall and strong doesn't mean I'm fit for a king. And they're like, no, no, we want Saul. He's really tall. <laughs> that rhymed. Uh, and, and so they elect Saul, right? <laughs> I'm a mess. So Saul was given a command, right? And here's where it all really falls apart. Here's where it all falls apart. The prophet Samuel tells Saul, listen, you need to destroy the Amalekites. King Agag and all his people, men, women, and children, utterly destroy them. And we find in the story that when the prophet shows up after that battle that Israel won, guess what he finds hanging out with Saul? And this is Matt's version. It's a little different in scripture, but you get the point. Guess what Samuel finds in there having a drink with Saul? King Agag, bound and not killed. And Samuel literally takes his sword out and hacks up King Agag into pieces. It's this really graphic story. And really the point of the whole story is the prophet tells him, you don't know what's best. You don't understand. The man of God is telling you that the Lord says utterly destroy them. Guess what you need to do? Utterly destroy them. This is going to come back to bite you in the tushy. And so the prophet hacks up the king, kills him, but the prophet also gives a gloom, dismal response, and he turns and he looks at the first king of Israel, and he says, listen to me, because you did not obey, remember last week's message, what was the point of Esther and Mordecai? To what? Obey. The prophet turns and looks at Saul, and he says to him, you and your family are going to suffer because of this decision to not obey. Eerily, in the same passage of scripture, we find a remarks from Mordecai to Esther saying, if you do not obey, eerily, what is going to happen? You and your father's family, but the Lord will bring redemption to these people. Huh, interesting. Because Saul had failed to annihilate the Amalekites, his reign was brought to an end. In this story, Mordecai and Haman, we see the reversal of the fateful event. Now it is the Amalekite who attempts the destruction of Israel. The affair appears to be a rematch between Saul and Agag, but this time it is Agag who has the upper hand. If the Lord leads you into a battle, you must defeat it. Why? Because he's leading you into it for a reason in that season. And if you don't, your kids are going to pay for it. We'll come back to that point. Hang there. This is the significance to Haman's genealogy being an Agagite. This is the significance of Mordecai, watch this, being chapter one, a Benjamite. Mordecai is Saul's great, 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 great. Haman is, is King Agag's great, 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 great. It's time to battle it out. 
Go ahead, don't finish the fight. Go ahead, Saul. You think it's best? You think you want to save some sheep for your sacrifices? You would do well by obeying the Lord. Why? Because the prophet tends to know scripture better than the king. And in this instance, I'm spinning everywhere. Why? Because I'm dehydrated. I need a drink. I need one. Why? Because in this instant, the prophet understood the book of Exodus, said that there will always be a war against Yahweh and Amalek. The war continues. Back to my outline. As you see the story unfold, work to align yourself with these characters. See what the Lord will give you. Listen, Haman is promoted. Now with the context in mind, the overarching thing that the Lord, this is a chess match. Yahweh and Amalek, the, the, the chess match is continuing. What we see as, you know, this crazy king, Xerxes, in, in like the movie 300, right? Uh, the, same, the same guy, the same era, what he's doing, he's, he's a pawn in this whole scheme. The Lord is working. The kings, the heart of the kings are in the hand of the Lord. We see the Lord working in spite of these crazy characters. The story really, and, and this is what we have to consider, The story isn't about what is natural, it is about what is supernatural. This is so applicable for today. As we consider news, as we read, as we study history, it is is just a fateful trap for Christians to fall into absorption of the characters rather than seeing where the characters fit into God's plan. And that's the point of Esther. God has a plan. And I'm not here to specifically say what Haman did or didn't do wrong. I'm here to point out the fact that he is playing into the saga and the war that, that has been and will be against spiritual forces in the unseen realm. That's really what this is about. Haman being promoted to the highest office of the land. Haman is representative of the enemy of the children of Israel. Verse 2, it says that he is elected to this place and he's clearly a villain. Just for sake of uh, you know, some, some practical help from this as I get to the, the meat of the message. How do you determine who the villain is? I mean, we, we live in a society of victimhood, let's be honest. I'm a victim. Someone's doing me wrong. Well, in order for that to be the case, then there has to be a villain, right? There has to be someone that is doing and inflicting the pain. And how do we, are, are we doing well as a society to identify villains? Or are we villainizing people who literally are there for our own good? This is also an issue that I see in the text, that Mordecai had a structure to identify a villain immediately. This guy comes on the scene, and Mordecai knows how to react. Why? Here's just some helpful, this isn't the message, this is just free, free things for you. Villains demand worship instead of worshiping Yahweh. And, and we're going to see this as it unfolds. I've heard messages about this historically, I mean, since I was, like, in my mother's womb. I've grown up in church. I've heard stories about the problem is that Haman demanded the worship. More than that, Mordecai was able to identify that Haman was opposed to God's plan. And it wasn't necessarily about Haman's agenda. Villains have a connection with steering worship away from the one true God. When, when you have a problem in your life, how do I identify that problem and, and really name them a villain if they're a villain? Is what they're doing taking glory from the Lord? If it's taking glory from you personally, they might not be a villain. This might be a life lesson. But if, if glory is being shifted from the Lord, we got a problem. And Mordecai identifies this. What do you do when evil is promoted? Many of you are are sitting in situations with bad people over you, and and you you can find yourself, as the characters are portrayed, being like, yeah, I'm in a situation where I'm Mordecai, and I got a Haman in my life. I got some confusion, right? I have some confusion in my life as how to handle this. Well, let's take a word from our fellow here, Mordecai. Look at verse number two in the text. The entire royal staff of the king's gate bowed down and paid homage to Haman because the king had commanded, stay with me, church, because the king had commanded this to be done for him. So what, what, I'm, sh- what I'm sharing with you here is it wasn't wrong for Haman to ask for them to bow. It wasn't wrong. It was culturally acceptable. In the kingdom, when you come into the presence of the king, what do you do? You bow. So I'm not, I'm not here to 
uh, you know, to say that this is the whole problem of the story. He asked him to bow. That's not the whole point. The point is, is how Haman goes about to fix what he calls his problem is clearly an attack on God and not Mordecai. So follow this. We find here that how Mordecai responds. Watch. The entire staff of the king's gate bowed down, paid homage uh, to Haman because the king had commanded this to be done for him. But Mordecai would not bow down or pay homage. So here's how Mordecai handled the villain. He did what was right. He did what was right. He knew in his mind something is not right. Now, let's just consider the story. Knowing his descendants, knowing where he comes from, knowing who his children were, can we sense that there would be some anti-Semitism in, in, in the story from the get? Can we sense that Mordecai from the beginning knew that that guy hated him, knew he hated his people, which means he knew that he hated his what? His God. So therefore, no. He did what was right. What do we do when we have a villain that shows up on the scene in our lives? Here's what you do. You do what's right. You don't have to attack them. We have a God that will fight for us. You don't have to figure out and scheme. Remember, the whole point of this story is that God is in what? Control. So on that arch, somewhere on it is you and I just doing what we're supposed to do. Do right because it's right to what? Do. Just do right. I don't know what to do. Pastor Matt, I'm going to need 30 minutes of your time. Okay, let's go. Let's hear about it. And in my mind, I'm going, this is only going to take about two minutes. What's going on? Well, 28 minutes later, listen, all you need to do is do right. All you need to do is be faithful. All you need to do is be consistent. Hey, have you prayed today? Hey, have you read your Bible today? Hey, were you nice to your wife today? Hey, were you kind? Were you loving? This isn't complicated. Oh, but I know. But all you got to do is do right. Listen, we don't need to worry about controlling the narrative. We have a God that controls it. If there's anything that the story is telling us is how do we operate when there's a villain present in our life? Guess what? The same way we operate when there isn't a villain in our life. Just do right. The the problem is, is when a problem shows up, we got to fix us. We got to go, now what do I need to do? Now what do I need to change? Lord, let me get all my stuff straight so that I can get back on that arch bandwagon. Because you've been running the other way for months. You've been going the other way. You've been on your own trajectory, doing your own thing. And it's amazing that when life happens, we seek to get back on God's plan. When all we needed to do was just do right from the get. Hey, I encourage you today, just do right. There's more to the story, though. Mordecai would not bow down. He would not worship. Haman devises a plan. And this is where you see the sense that there's more to the story. Mordecai could have just been taken and hung. Mordecai could have just been uh, singled out. But this shows the utter pride and disdain for the children of Israel. Why? Because Haman doesn't even want to give his subjects the satisfaction. He doesn't want to give Mordecai the satisfaction of having his subjects go to him. And that would mean that Haman what? Noticed him. Literally, I believe personally that Haman uh, derived this whole entire plan to kill all of the Jews just for what? One person. There, there's a truth here that's monumental and it's not the, it's not the message. When am I going to get to the message? Holy cow, it's 12.04. I'm going to get to it. This is not the message. This is extra. The point is this, is that what I want you to see is that Haman in this plan was willing to pay 375 tons of silver to enact this plan. When Haman went to King Ahasuerus, he said, hey, hey, king, hey, I I wanna say something to you. Okay. Here's what he said, he's like, there's a group of people, I wanna identify a couple things here. There's a group of people in our kingdom that don't obey you, king. So here's what I see at work. The first thing that the devil does, the ultimate villain, is that he, he tells a sliver of truth, a sliver of truth with his lie. Was it a command for people to bow to Haman, given by the king, yes or no? Yes. The king commanded that everyone bow before Haman. So first of all, he said to the king, here's a group of people that do not obey you, king. So first of all, that's a lie. 
because they paid their taxes, they were good citizens, they, they obeyed all the other laws, and it was within Persian law to allow them to continue the Mosaic law. So they were well within their laws and operating within their laws within the kingdom. Why do we see that? Mordecai just saved the king's life. Mordecai was at a position in the gate. We have a, a queen being elected to an office. That's a Jew, ultimately. My point is, is they were moving and breathing and operating within this king's structure in a positive way, which means they were obedient. But the Lord, I'm sorry, but the devil takes one, one thing, one little thing and twists it. And he says, they don't obey you, king. That wasn't the truth. They did obey him. One time he chose to do something that was in disobedience doesn't mean you throw the baby out with the bathwater. The other thing I see is this. 375 tons of silver. Understanding that Haman did not want to give Mordecai the satisfaction of saying, I noticed the fact that you were in defiance. He, can, he, he, he comes up with the plan. I'm going to kill all the Jews. I'm going to kill every Jew in the kingdom really just to kill what? One. That was an overreaction. That, I'm going to kill a million of you just for you. Like, holy cow. And what do I see here? The devil's an idiot. He's an idiot. More than he's an idiot, he's a liar. But I don't want to miss this. This is really, really crucial. Jesus paid the ultimate price and gave his life. But just because Jesus gave his life doesn't mean the devil isn't willing to give his silver. Many of you are subject to a plan that the devil has for you and you give in to it just because someone was willing to pay a price. Don't miss that. Well, you know, they're really good friends. You know, they... We went on vacation together. They helped us out in this hard time. It's amazing that people derive their Christian lives and their whole constructs of what people pay and help them do, and they end up being controlled by a narrative that the devil has for them. We would be missed. We, we, it would be just a huge remiss if we read this passage and we missed the fact that Haman was willing to, to come up with, he was a rich dude, 375 tons of silver. And I think back to a passage when the devil says to Jesus, Bow down and worship me. And what? All this will be yours. If he didn't think he could give it to him, why would he have said it to the Son of God? You have to be wise as serpents and harmless as, as doves. It is high time we as Christians identify the fact that Satan controls resources in this world and he is deploying those resources to ruin your families. He is deploying resources into your homes, into your lives, and all he's doing, he's bankrolling it. He'll steal it to get it. Why? Because he's got thieves everywhere. He'll take the resources that we know are the Lord's, and he'll deploy them into your homes, into your children's lives. Why? To gain an advantage. Don't miss the price that Haman was willing to pay for the execution of the Jews. In your life, there are two people vying for, your, vying for you. Jesus paid the debt with his life. Satan will never pay a debt with his life because he loves himself way too much. But it doesn't mean that he's not paying and actively working to purchase your love. Some of us really need to take an assessment in our lives and see where our loyalties lie. Why is that? Huh. Wow. That's not Christian. That's not, hmm. It's, it's worth noting. It's, it's not the whole point. There's a price for you. The ultimate insults here. Man, I'm going to go into next week. It's two chapters. It is what it is. Honestly, though, I can, I can, I can, I can get there. Haman constructs the edict to be carried out. This is probably one of the most powerful things that I've noticed in a long time in Scripture. Look at... Look at verse number 13 in your text. I, I'm going to do a backflip on this point. I'm telling you, this is insane. Wait till you see this. Verse 13. When Haman convinces the king to give him his signet ring to kill the Jews, it gets darker. Look at it. Letters were sent out by the couriers to each of the royal provinces telling the officials to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, all the Jewish people young and old, women and children, and plunder their possessions on a single day. 
the, watch, the 13th day of Adar, the 12th month. How many think that's significant? Why that specific day and time would be mentioned? It is. The command was given by Saul to do the exact same thing 600 years before, and he failed to do it. I believe that Haman had the guts to do it. I believe that the mistake that Saul made, Haman wouldn't have made. And the Lord had to intervene. Here's what's significant about that date. It's the day before Passover. Understand this, that in the life, in the feasts of the Jewish people, they celebrated one day unlike any other, and that day was the day of Passover. That word Passover, I'm sorry, I'm getting loud for the baby, that poor thing. I do get loud. I just realized that we have a newborn in here. Oh, my goodness. We have a day that they celebrate, Passover. Uh, I'm really happy about this one. I'm sorry, baby. But here's the point. Consider this. When God chooses a people, he chooses a slave to set free. He goes before them. He, he establishes, he, he gives ten plagues on Egypt. Do you remember the story? And at the very end, he tells them, he says, listen, you perform a sacrifice. You eat everything of this meal. You take the blood. You apply it to the doorpost. And because I am your God, because Yahweh is the one true God, any force that comes against you, understand this. I will attack them and not you. I will protect you. And when the death angel came through Egypt that night and killed all the firstborns, what did Pharaoh finally say? Go. They were a people that were protected by the one and only true God. And in this story, Haman goes, it's a year. You have to understand that when Haman made this decree, don't you think that he could have announced it and said, go, here's the money, do the bidding, kill all the Jews. Don't you think he could do that? Not with his ego. Satan really thinks he's going to win. Satan really thinks that he is going to break through, that he will defeat Yahweh. Are you kidding me? He was so cocky. He said, and guess what? We're going to kill all of them the day before their Lord is able to protect them. Oh, my goodness. What an insult. Haman says, you know what? Let the decree be on this day. Can you imagine the weight that every Jew felt in their heart the day before? Maybe, maybe we won't make it out of Egypt this time. Maybe we won't make it. Maybe God is not going to prevail in this moment. Can you imagine the fear that that instilled? The devil will always come down on you. He will always say that the Lord won't make a way. You're not going to get out of this one. That problem, that issue, that relationship. He'll always put it the day before you think the Lord's going to come through. And he'll use that to pressure you in fear, to keep you in, a, in paralysis spiritually. Don't, I mean, an unbelievable day for Haman to select. What an insult. It was a year away. You Jewish people sit in this a year. You're not going to celebrate Passover this year. This time, I'm going to end it like Saul could not. Mordecai's response. Mordecai's response sackcloth and ashes, prayer and fasting. We find that Esther sends her servant out. It was against the law for Mordecai to be in sackcloth and ashes inside the gates of the king, inside of the castle gates. That could not be in the presence of the king. No sorrow, nothing unhappy, always happy, always drinking. None, no sackcloth could be in the presence, but he knew, Mordecai knew that if I just do right, if I just take that next step, I'll go as far as I can. I'll stay within the boundaries. I'll sit outside the king's gate. Word will get back to Queen Esther. And sure enough, why is her cousin out there wailing and crying? He's not eating. He is a man that has been, uh, you know, that saved the king and has great leadership. What is he doing? They go back and forth about how Mordecai thinks they should resolve this situation. It is a problem. The day before Passover, he, he's going to kill us all. He sent the edict out. Have you read it? Do you know? Of course she hasn't because she's within the walls of the castle. And then Esther begins to call the shots. Look at verse 13. I'm going to be a helicopter from here for the next 10 minutes. Stay with me. Look at verse number 13. Mordecai told the messenger. Re reply, reply to Esther. Don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. Here's what Mordecai told her. He said, this plan, it, it's, it's really bad. 
This is something Mordecai knew the scriptures. This is 600 years in the making. And he knows it and he's out for blood. What are we gonna do? What's the first thing Mordecai says to Esther? And this is the message, here you go. He says this, number one, your comforts can interfere with your calling. He says, in this moment, Queen Esther, understand that I'm outside the castle and you're what? Inside. Hey, America, if there's anything that's gonna interfere with people coming to know Jesus, it could be your castle. It could be your position. It could be that you are a queen and you are a king and the rest of the world looks at you as someone of privilege. Know that your comforts can interfere with your calling. Just because you're not desperate doesn't mean that your neighbor isn't either. Understand that we are in a place of comfort. Our nation is a mess. Why? Because we're a bunch of spoiled brats. And you heard that online. A bunch of spoiled brats. My candidate didn't get elected. Since when are we serving this kingdom and not that kingdom? I'm just saying, if Mordecai was here in sackcloth and ashes, he would look at each one of us and say, I think your comforts are interfering with your calling. I think we got a bunch of kings and queens here. Esther, don't forget where you came from. Christian, online, in person, do you remember where you were when the Lord found you? And he picked you up out of the mess and established your goings, told you where to go, what to do. If, and, and this is a moment for you, if, if you don't have a calling, if you've never had a purpose, if you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, know that your comfort in this life will not comfort you in the next. And that he is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life worth living. But Christians, when this story, when it, when it comes and boils at the end of chapter four, the first thing he says to her is, okay, queen, I can imagine. They're going back and forth. They're sending a messenger back and forth. I can imagine she just went, what an insult. Doesn't he know that, remember her beauty is what she had? Doesn't he know that this is why we're here in the first place? <laughs> remember, that was the story. How many of you remember she wasn't her own? She allowed God to have those gifts and abilities. Some of you, it's your comfort. Online, it's your comfort. Don't miss that. Number two, oh, man, this is so weighty. Miss your calling, and it's your family who will suffer. I don't need to say much here. Listen to verse 14. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. Saul is a prime example of this, and Mordecai knew it. It's the same family. He goes, are you going to make the same mistake that great, 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 great grandfather did? It was him. Guess what? He was removed from office, but guess what? His sons were killed. His sons were killed. Esther, you're an orphan. If you choose to not fight this battle and you're killed, you won't have a child that carries on the family name. When are we going to figure this out online and in person? That if we ignore our calling, it's our children who will suffer. Here's, here's, cover the baby's ears. It's enough passing the buck. I know that pornography is something. I know that other relationship is something. I know that alcohol is something. I know sin is hard. It has cords, Proverbs describes it. The cords of the wicked that hook us. But if you don't break the cords of sin, you're passing them on to your kids. Understand that if you don't win this battle, Esther, it's not you, it's your family. And understand he didn't say, all the Jewish people will die. We are so self-absorbed, we think God's plan hinges on us. God is saying, uh, no, I, I've made a promise. It's called a covenant that Abraham will be, David will be the king. God is going to work his work. Listen, if you, choose, if you choose to miss this, guess what? It's your kids who are going to suffer. Flip this. Flip it on its head. Point number one, your comforts are interfering with your calling. 
It's not our job to make our children's lives comfortable. It's our job to promote the calling in our children's lives. Why? Because our children are not ours, they're the Lord's. My wife and I, when we raise our children, we, every lesson is, is a gospel-centered perspective. Everything is, a, everything is a talk, everything is, do you understand where this fits in the grand scheme of God's plan? Everything. Why? Because that's our purpose. It's time we instill a gospel-centered purpose in our children's lives and stop living vicariously through our children everywhere where we miss the boat as kids. I just need you to be happy. I just need you to be successful. I need you to hit this game winning field goal. I need you to be this little toddler in Tierra. <laughs> At what point are we going to realize that we missed the blessing and now we're living it through our kids? That's a problem. Why? Because you're, you're damning your children because of your own selfishness. I mean, this is, it's weighty. But the example here is generational defeat. And I don't know about you. I'm coming from the same place in my family. I come from a long line of alcoholics, a bunch of 101st airborne paratroopers that jump out of airplanes, get done with their service to their country, and then go drink themselves to death. Alcoholism has killed, I've only known, I think, two of my uncles. The rest of them were all drunk driving accidents. I'm well aware of generational sins in my family. Well aware. Why? Because that's what the devil goes for in my own life. And he's not getting this one. Why? Because he's not getting my kids. I'm telling you. He's not. It's bigger than you and I. It's our children. Number three, command your life by the Spirit to have victory against the villains. This is it. Number one, comforts can interfere with your calling. It's true. Number two, miss your calling and your kids will suffer. Number three, Look at verse 16. This is, this is the money. The narrative shifts. Look at verse 16. It says this. Go. This is Esther talking. Take this feminist. She's taking charge. She's taking control. Look at it. Here it is. Go. Assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa. And watch this. Fast for me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. After that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, famous line, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything Esther had commanded him. Listen, listen to this, church. Here's the reversal. Up until this point, Mordecai said, don't reveal your ethnicity. Now we know why. Now we know why. He said to her, do as I say. He came every day to the place in the past palace. How are you doing? Are you obeying? You take everything they tell you to take into the king's chambers. You got it? Got it. But in this moment, what happens? Esther, the Lord brought you here for such a time as this. Don't let the palace blind you. Understand your calling. And then in this moment, she can either, she can either choose to live in her privilege or command her calling. Some of you need to be given maybe the permission to command your calling. It's not mentioned in this passage that she prayed. Why? Because the whole theme of this book is that God is not mentioned, but that he is what? Active. It's understood that if they are Jews and that they're in sackcloth and ashes and that if they're fasting for three days, that they're also what? Pray. She commanded her calling in the spirit. The devil has been luring you long enough. He's been, paying, he's been paying for you to be hooked on whatever it is that you're hooked on. He's been pacifying your desires for your children to actually do something with their lives and saying, it'll be okay, it's a good enough career. He, he's been saying, it's all right that you go to church, you don't have to tell anybody else about it. I'll let you go to church, I'll let you have your relationship with Jesus, you don't need to save anybody else. He, he's been doing that long enough, church. It's time that you command your calling. It comes a point in time where you have to say, Lord, I'm submitting to you. I'm submitting to your will. I'm ready for you to work in my life. If she would have said no, it would have been her and her family. I'm not here to say something that the scripture doesn't say. All the Jews would have died. 
So what am I saying to you? Hey, this is about you and your family. It's time to command your calling. 